So I'm going to read Frederick Douglass's My Bondage and My Freedom. My Bondage and My Freedom. Okay. And uh, this is uh, about William Covey. William Covey was the, or Edward Cuddy. Fucking Edward fucking Covey. So you had Mr. and Mrs. Ald, who was his master for, during his teenage years. Uh, they tried to teach him how to read. He got mad. Then she became a real big dick. Uh, but beforehand, um, you had the, uh, uh, or no, afterwards, you had Mr. Edward Covey, who was going to break him because he was starting to be known as an unruly slave, uh, Frederick Douglass was. So, chapter 15. Covey, the Negro Breaker. So these are passages about Edward Covey, who was Frederick Douglass's main arch nemesis in his Up from Slavery. Okay. The morning of the 1st of January, 1834, with its chilling wind and pinching frost, quite in harmony with the winter in my own mind, found me with my little bundle of clothing at the end of a stick, swung across my shoulder on the main road, bending my way toward Covey's whither I had been imperiously ordered by Master Thomas. The latter had been as good as his word had committed me without reserve to the mastery of Mr. Edward Covey. Eight or ten years now had passed since I had been taken from my grandmother's cabin in Tuckahoe. In these year, years, for the most part, I had spent in Baltimore, where, as the reader has already seen, I was treated with comparative tenderness. I was now about to sound profounder depths, depths in slave life. The rigors of a field less tolerable than the field of battle awaited me. My new master was notorious for his fierce and savage disposition, and my only con uh, consolation in going to live with him was the certainty of finding him precisely as represented by common fame. There was neither joy in my heart nor elasticity in my step as I started in search of the tyrant's home. Starvation made me glad to leave Thomas Auld's, and the cruel lash made me dread to go to Covey's. Escape, escape was impossible, so heavy and sad I paced the seven miles which separated Covey's house from St. Michael's, thinking much by the solitary way averse to my condition, but thinking was all I could do, like a fish in a net allowed to play for a time. I was now dawned rapidly to the shore, secured at all points. I am, thought I, but the sport of a power which makes no account either of my welfare or of my happiness. By a law which I clearly, uh, I can clearly comprehend, but cannot evade nor resist. I'm ruthlessly snatched from the hearth of a fond grandmother, and hurried away to the home of a mysterious old master. Again, I am removed from there to a master in Baltimore. Thence I am snatched away to the eastern shore to be valued with the beast of the field, and with them divided and set apart for possessor. Then I am sent back to Baltimore, and by the time I have formed new attachments and have begun to hope with no more rude shocks shall touch me, a difference arises between brothers, and I am again broken up and sent to St. Michael's, and now from the latter place, I'm footing my way to the home of a new master where I'm given to understand that like a wild, young, working animal, I'm to be broken to the yoke of a bitter and lifelong bondage. With thoughts and reflections like these, I came in sight of a small wood-colored building about a mile from the main road, which from the description I had received at starting, I easily recognized as my new home. The Chesapeake Bay, upon the jutting banks of which the little wood-colored house was standing, white with foam raised by the heavy north wind, west wind, Poplar Island covered with the thick black pine forest standing out amid this half ocean, and Kent Point stretching its sandy desert-like shores out into the foam-cested bay were all in sight and deepened the wild and desolate aspect of my new home. The good clothes I had brought with me from Baltimore were now worn thin and had not been replaced, for Master Thomas was as little careful to provide us against cold as against hunger. Met here by a north wind sweeping through an open space of 40 miles, I was glad to make any port, and therefore I speedily pressed on to the little wood-colored house. The family consisted of Mr. and Mrs. Covey, Miss Kemp, a, broke -backed, a broken-backed woman, a sister of Mrs. Covey, William Hughes, cousin, 
to Edward Covey, Carolyn the Cook, Bill Smith the Hired Hand, and myself. Bill Smith, Bill Hughes, and myself were the working force of the farm, which consisted of three or four hundred acres. I was now, for the first time in my life, to be a field hand. And in my new employment, I found myself even more awkward than a green country boy may be supposed to be upon his first entrance into the bewildering scene of city life. And my awkwardness gave me much trouble. Strange and unnatural as it may seem, I had been at my new home but three days before Mr. Covey. My brother in the Methodist church gave me a bitter foretaste of what was in reserve for me. I presume he thought that since he had but a single year and wished to complete his work, the sooner he began, the better. Perhaps he thought that by coming to blows at once, we should mutually better understand our relations. But to whatever motive, direct or indirect, the cause may be referred, I had not been in his possession three whole days before he subjected me to a most brutal chastisement. Under his heavy blows, blood flowed freely, and whales were left on my back as large as my little finger. So he hit him on his back, and he got like... As, as big as his little finger, he had more things on his back as big as his little finger. The sores on my back from this flogging continued for weeks, for they were kept open by the rough and coarse cloth which I wore for shirting. The occasion and details of this first chapter of my experience as a field hand must be told that the reader may seem how unreasonable as well as how cruel my new master Co Covey was. The whole thing I found to be characteristic of the man, and I was probably treated no worse by him than scores of lads who had previously been committed to him for reasons similar to those which induced my master to place me with him. But here are the facts connected with the affair precisely as they occurred. On one of the coldest days of the month of January, 1834, I was ordered at daybreak to get a load of wood from a forest about two miles from the house. In order to perform this work, Mr. Covey gave me a pair of unbroken oxen, for it seems his breaking abilities had not been turned in this direction. And I may remark in passing that working animals in the south are seldom so well trained as in the north, in due form and with all proper ceremony. I was introduced to this huge yoke of unbroken oxen and was carefully told which was buck and which one was darby, which one was in hand and which one was the offhand ox. The master of this important ceremony was no less a person than Mr. Edward Covey himself, and the introduction was the first of the kind I had ever had. My life hitherto had led me away from horned cattle, and I had no knowledge of the art of managing them. What was meant by the in ox was against the off ox, when both were equally fastened to one cart and under one yoke. I could not easily divine, and the difference implied by the names and the peculiar duties of each were alike Greek to me. Why was not the off ox called the in ox? Where and what is the reason for this dis distinction in names? Where there is none in the things themselves. After initiating me into the woe, back, gee, hither, the entire spoken language between oxen and dri driver, Mr. Covey took a rope about ten feet long and one inch thick and placed one end of it around the horns of the in hand ox and gave the other end to me. Tell me that if the oxen started to run away as the scamp knew they would, I must hold on to the rope and stop them. I need not tell anyone who is acquainted with either the strength or the dispossession, disposition of an untamed ox that this order was about as unreasonable as a command to shoulder a mad bull. I had neither, never driven oxen before, and I was as awkward as a driver as it is possible to conceive. It did not answer for me to plead ignorance to Mr. Covey. There was something in his manner that quite forbade that. He was a man to whom a slave seldom fit any disposition to seek. Cold, distant, morose, with a face wearing all the marks of captious pride, malicious sternness, he repelled all advances. Covey was not a large man. He was only about five feet, ten inches in height, I should think, short-necked, round soldiers, of quick and wiry motion, of thin and wolfish visage, with a pair of small greenish-gray eyes, set well back under a forehead without dignity, and constantly in motion and floating his passions rather than his thoughts and sight, but denied them utterance in words. The creature presented an appearance altogether ferocious and sinister, disagreeable and forbidding to, in the extreme. It's Edward fucking Covey, right? When he spoke, it was from the corner of his mouth in a sort of light growl like a dog when an attempt is made to take a bone from him. The fellow had already made me believe him even worse 
than he had been presented with his directions and without stopping to question I started for the woods quite anxious to perform my first exploit in driving in a credible manner the distance from the house to the woods gate a full mile I should think was passed over with very little difficulty for the although the animals ran I was fleet enough in the open field to keep pace with them, especially as they pulled me along in the end of the rope, but on reaching the woods I was speedily thrown into a distressing plight. The animals took fright and started off ferociously into the woods, carrying the cart full tilt against the trees over stumps and dashing from side to side in a manner altogether frightful as I held the rope. I expected every moment to be crushed between the cart and the huge trees among which they were so furiously dashing after running thus for several minutes my oxen were finally brought to a stand by a tree against which they had dashed themselves with great violence upsetting the cart and entangling themselves among sundry young saplings by the shock the body of the cart was flung in one direction the wheels and tongue in another and all in the greatest confusion there I was all alone in a thick wood to which I was a stranger my cart upset and shattered my oxen entangled wild and raged and I poor soul but a green hand to set all this disorder right. I know no, no more of oxen than the oxen driver is supposed to know wisdom after standing a few moments surveying the damage and disorder and not without a presentiment that this trouble would draw upon, after it others even more distressing. I took one end of the cart body and by an extra alley of strength I lifted it toward the axle tree from which it had been violent, violently flung, and after much pulling and straining, I succeeded in getting the body of the cart in its place. This was an important step out of the difficulty, and this performance increased my courage for the work which remained to be done. The cart was provided with an axe, a tool with which I had become pretty well acquainted in the shipyard at Baltimore. With this, I cut down the saplings by which my oxen were entangled and again pursued my journey with my heart in my mouth, lest the oxen should again take it into their senseless heads to cup, cut up a caper. My fears were groundless. Their spree was over for the present, and the rascals now moved off as soberly as though their behavior had been natural and exemplary. On reaching the part of the forest where I had been the day before chopping wood, I filled the cart with a heavy load as a security against another running away. But the neck of an ox is equal in strength to iron. It defies all ordinary burdens when excited, tame, and docile to a proverb. When well trained, the ox is the most solemn and intractable track, of animals, but uh, when but half broken to the yoke. I now saw in my situation several points of similarity with that of the oxen. They were property, so was I. They were to be broken. And so was I. Covey was to break me, and I was to break them. Break and be broken. Such is life. Half the day already gone in my face, not yet homeward. I required only two days' experience and observation to teach me that such apparent waste of time would not be lightly overlooked by Mr. Edward fucking Covey. Fucking Edward fucking Covey. Okay, he turns out to be a bitch later on. <laughs> so, um... I hurried towards home, but on reaching the lane gate, I was met with the crowning disaster for the day. This gate was a fair specimen of southern handicraft. There was two huge posts, 18 inches in di diameter, rough, hewed, and squared, and the heavy gate was so hung on one of these that it opened only about half the distance, the proper distance. On arriving here, it was necessary for me to let go the end of the rope on the horns of the in-hand ox, and now, as soon as the gate was open, and I let go of it to get the rope Again, uh, I let go of it to get the rope again. Off went my oxen, making nothing of their load, full tilt, and in doing so, they caught the huge gate between the wheel and the cart body, literally crushing it to splinters. And coming only within a few inches of subjecting me to a, a similar crushing, for I was just in advance of the wheel when it struck the left gate post with these two hairbreadth escape. I thought I could successfully explain to Mr. Covey, Mr. Edward fucking Covey, the delay and avert apprehending, apprehended punishment. I was not without a faint hope of being commended for the stern resolution which I had displayed in accomplishing the difficult task. A task which I afterwards learned even Covey himself would not have undertaken without first driving the oxen for some time in the open field 
preparatory to their going into the woods. But in this, I was disappointed. On coming to him, his countenance assumed an aspect of rigid displeasure. Uh, rigid displeasure, and I gave him the history of the casualties of my trip. His wolfish face and his greenish eyes became intensely ferocious. Go back to the woods again, he said, muttering something else about wasting time, and I hastily obeyed. But I had not gone far on my way when I saw him coming after me. My oxen now behaved themselves with singular propriety, opposing the, the present conduct to my representation of the former antics. I almost wished, now that Kobe was coming, they would do something in keeping with their earlier dispositions. So, Mr. Kobe's not happy, and he's chasing after Mr. Douglas.